Hello again, everybody. It's Leslie Kerwin here again from the BBC, from Business Daily. And, and now we've got something called Hotspots, six personal views of the future, which I guess is really what this whole conference is about, looking into the future. And I'm going to start off with Jin Zidel, who is the founder and chairman of Blue Planet Network, which aims to provide safe drinking water to rural communities in the developing world. Jin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just start by uh, saying why I'm a, what drove me to this and what continues to drive me to work in this field. There are harsh realities. These are just some of the harsh realities. Is that one billion members of our human family do not have access to safe drinking water. That's one out of every seven of us. The harsh reality is that 2.4 billion people, that's one out of every three members of our human family have to urinate and defecate in the open because they do not have access to sanitation facilities. 5,000 children under the age of five die each and every day because of dehydration from the chronic diarrhea due from unsafe drinking water. The harsh reality is that tens of millions of children, mostly girls, do not go to school because they spend their days, average of six, hour, six kilometers a day, carrying safe drinking water in a, five, in a five gallon jerry can that weighs 40 pounds. The harsh reality is that 200 million hours each and every day are spent by women and girls fetching water. And the harsh reality is that it does not have to be this way. For the small amount of money, for $30, for the cost of a medium price bottle of wine, we can provide safe drinking water to one person for life. That's at 30 bucks. I'm a Jewish junk dealer, and to me, that's a really, really good value proposition. <laughs> and another really harsh reality is that if we can't solve this problem, for which there are no, let's say, uh, economic or political battles, there's no philosophical battles, I don't know of anybody who doesn't think safe drinking water is a, is a good idea. If we can't solve this global issue, you show me one that we can solve. So I would, I would posit that we need to solve this one first, and then we can go on to your know, about climate change, uh, food, et cetera, et cetera. So what is uh, uh, Blue Planet Run, or Blue Planet Network? We used to be called Blue Planet Run. We are a, uh, a global uh, NGO, an award-winning uh, global NGO, that is making a significant and exponential increase in the impact of safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene uh, programs all over the world, and particularly in rural communities and developing nations. Through the integration of people, process, and technology, we have developed a global online platform and tool set that actually connects funders NGOs and communities with a, uh, a system that allows for the, them to find programs which are extremely efficient, cost effective, and effective. And we do this around the world. We have, I think now we have 93 partners in 25 countries, and these partners have done 1,400 projects benefiting about a million people so far. The uh, uh, platform is completely open. We have no passwords. I'm a great believer that if everyone can see everything, there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Early on, we identified four challenges that face our sector, and we call the sector WASH, water, sanitation, and hygiene. Those four challenges are going to scale, lack of collaboration, lack of transparency, and lack of providing meaningful impact and analysis of measuring impacts. So if I can take, um, are we about time, we've got another minute? Or that's another it? minute, absolutely, okay. thanks Jim. Well, anyhow, if anyone wishes to uh, speak with me further about how we uh, have met these four challenges, and I will say they do face <coughs> many other sectors that are working at the bottom of the pyramid. And one last thing, anyone who would like a copy of our book, Either uh, give me a business card with the word send book on it, and I will send you a book. Well, I don't know about a personal view of the future. It seems to me that's a great hope for the future. Jin Zidel, thank you very much.
And now Andre de Fusco, uh, CEO and Director of Synvenio Biosystems, who has two decades of experience as a technology entrepreneur. Okay, thank you. I sat over here because I thought I'd be last, but that, that's <laughs> fine. Um, no problem. You know, it's very difficult for, uh, uh, I guess, summarize a, a view of the future in four minutes. There's so much to talk about. We just saw some very moving films. Um, I guess the way I think about it is uh, I break it down into what I do and the things that I have experience with. So uh, it's my second time at FIRE. Last year I talked about some of the genomic uh, progress our company was making, but I, I don't want to uh, really talk about our company. What I want to talk about is the implication of that kind of work. And I summarized it in a, in a bunch of notes that, of course, I'm not going to use in this little talk, but I think it has to do with longevity. I think uh, my view of the future is that uh, uh, you know, fairly long lives are at hand, uh, and I mean 150 years, 120 years, it's certainly within, within reach. Um, whether this is desirable or not is another discussion, but uh, a lot of what we are uh, doing uh, is going to have the effect of prolonging life, uh, and that has to do with catching disease much earlier. It has to do with maintaining uh, ourselves and maintaining our lives and our, our lifestyles. So, um, you know, to overly simplify, we don't have any problems maintaining our homes or doing preventive maintenance. We don't have any problems maintaining uh, equipment. We all understand that concept. When it comes to our own health, we don't seem to do as much. Uh, so there has to be a huge shift away from treating uh, disease or chronic disease to treating wellness. Uh, there are no real economic models for that. They're just starting to emerge now. And the part that we're particularly focused on, as some of you know, uh, is the genomic uh, aspect of disease. Uh, I've spent the last four years really implementing what Craig Venter uh, and his team invented and, and a lot of other people, uh, George Church, et cetera. So we look at cells. We have the ability to look at the DNA of cells um, and predict uh, what they're going to do. That means you can prevent disease. Uh, you can take action on congenital defects. Um, and you can essentially improve people's quality of life because you can avoid the problem. Um, the repercussions of this are not immediately clear. There are plenty of study groups around, but I think it's a desirable, uh, it's something to strive towards. I think we're going to live longer lives. What that means is that we're going to preserve the institutional knowledge of humanity. I think if people can live much longer, we don't have to spend you know, a third of our years sleeping. We don't have to spend 30 or 40 years getting an education. We don't have to repeat a bunch of the things that take so long to repeat. We're going to learn, you know, war is obsolete. We're going to recycle bottle caps. You know, everybody's going to understand that. And um, we just need to live longer. There's a lot of knowledge that's lost. lost. So I think it is a desirable a goal, and I think it's actually something that can be, uh, can be modeled and can be worked towards. Plastic surgery is going to change, you know. Uh, um, you know, I have a friend working on submental fat, and maybe that'll work for me, but you know, the concept of a facelift will be different. We'll get one at age 80. We'll get it for the next 40 years. Replacing knees like James Balog, you know, that, that'll be uh, a matter of course. Hips, you know, all the parts that allow us to live longer, but also productive lives. Um, so that's where I would leave it. Uh, if I say vision of the future, that's how I would respond to that. Andre, thanks okay. very much for that. Now, John Vadino from One to the World, which is a two-way webcast platform, uh, but you're here to talk about education. It's my little passion, yeah. Um, so this is kind of a challenge. Yesterday I talked about uh, education and how in India there's 500 million people under 25 years of age. In the United States, uh, a study from Georgetown University says that we're going to add, need to add 20 million college graduates. And I talked about a little bit about the Khan Academy. I mean, if you don't know what that is, go on YouTube and you'll find it. Um, I found it because my sixth grade old son was in class and had a new teacher who was a great math teacher, but he was from Vietnam and his English wasn't so good. And they had a uh, new math that was brought into the school that year. I had to go find the Khan Academy to understand what this new math was, even though I understood the equation. That seemed pretty ridiculous to me. So I would watch the Khan Academy, figure out what the new math was for this geometry equation, and then go back to my kid and try and teach them the way. We actually got parents in the class together because they didn't get it either, and the parents started using Khan Academy <coughs> before the kids did. So here's the challenge. Um, and I was talking to a couple of guys this morning about this great professor at Stanford who's about to retire. We need to find five corporations in science, technology, engineering, and math 
we're going to sponsor a contest to find the best 10,000 teachers in this world. We need to capture their course on different subjects. We need to put those online. And we need to give our kids access to those. And we need to take government out of it. We need to take the schools out of it. Because they have too far to go to change. So my vision is that we can use corporate sponsorship and a contest to capture these, and I'm making up the number 10,000 professors, in every uh, STEM uh, class and put those online and really jumpstart education in this country. Then I think the education system, Mark was talking the first night about logistics. I believe the logistics of education is broken. And the only way to fix that is to turn it on its head. Thank you. John, thanks very much for that. Alex Gonaris, CEO of Conquerix, which provides scalable operating systems for data centers. Alex, you want to talk about the economics of who pays what for the cloud. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, thanks, everybody. Good morning. And as uh, Andre mentioned, the videos we saw just now and last night really help uh, put perspective on what's truly important. So my topic maybe is uh, smaller. Uh, but the notion is there's a quiet revolution happening in how software is built today uh, that I like to call the mini core revolution. And it's really driven by what's going on with the cloud. You know, software's been a great business for many, many years. And if you flash back to the 90s, uh, it was genius. You'd uh, get a bunch of folks together, you'd write some software, and then you'd hand it off to your customer. And your customer would pay for all the capital costs to buy all the computers to run it. They'd pay all the maintenance. They'd pay to secure it and everything else. And all you had to pay for as a software person was to write the software. Now with the cloud, that's changing. Now all of a sudden, the software writer is paying the capital cost and paying the cost of securing it. And we heard a lot about security from Gus and others uh, at this conference. So hold that thought. Now look at what's going on with software. I'm sorry, with hardware. Moore's Law continues unabated. So for $300,000 today, everybody online can go do this. Go to newegg.com. You can buy 2,688 cores, 10 terabytes of RAM, and half a petabyte of storage for uh, $300,000. And that would take just the space of one rack, so basically half the size of a refrigerator. Now, for those of you technical in the room, that not that long ago, used to be a whole data center. So what happens now when, for basically the size of a refrigerator and 300,000 bucks, you can do what used to take an entire data center to do? Now the trick is to take advantage of all those cores and all this new hardware, you actually need a new generation of software. The uh, old style stuff that we were doing before, whether it was C++, Java, C Sharp, it's called imperative programming, uh, that doesn't scale well to take advantage of this hardware. And there's uh, newer mathematical ways of writing programs known as functional programming, stuff called Erlang, if you're familiar with that, that can take advantage of all this hardware. So what we're going to see is companies that make the shift to many core that can take advantage of these, uh, you know, a rack, uh, data center in Iraq are going to have a order of magnitude price performance advantage over any of their competitors. And it's going to be a very, very fundamental shift in software for the, over the next five, 10 years. Alex, thanks very much for that. David Garrison, the CEO of iBomb, which provides the world's largest wireless networks. Um, David, you've had 20 years' experience in telecoms and technology companies. So what's your vision of the future? Uh, my vision of the future is wrong, Leslie. That I know for sure. <laughs> so that's my disclaimer. That's good the, stuff. The, the future is wrong. Uh, my vision of the future is wrong. That said, I think we live in the most amazing time because I think we're at the beginning of the third communications revolution. And these revolutions, when you're in the middle of it, is sometimes hard to see. But let me suggest to you that the first communications revolution of the last 100 years was the introduction of the telephone. As we all know, voice-centric, connected businesses eventually connected residences and changed the way we do business. I think the second revolution was the introduction of the internet. No surprise to anyone here. We shifted from a voice orientation to a data and text orientation, enabling, for example, wide email and different websites and repositories of information. But the third revolution, and each of these revolutions, by the way, is a confluence of different technologies and events. I think the third revolution that we're just at the dawn of today has three elements to it. The first is 
very low cost uh, mobile networks. And I think primarily that's Wi-Fi, which is a fraction of the cost of 3G, 4G. And today it is um, a technology that's being embedded in more and more devices. The second event that has occurred is the advent of um, social networks that connect people without a relationship. And what I mean by that, we're talking, we're talking at lunch uh, with Andre yesterday. You know, in the past, if you wanted information, you would go to somebody you know and say, could you please tell me, how do I get clean water to the masses of the people, Jim? And I'd know it was you because we had a relationship. Today, I can go get that information from people that I have no relationship with. So it's information, um, whether it's sites like Yelp or other sites, information from people that I have no relationship with except for a common interest in some piece of information or some experience. So the second trend here is this advent of networks connecting people without relationships. And the third are very powerful handheld devices that are video centric. So one of the characteristics I think of the third revolution is it's about a video centricity. So the first was about voice, the second was about text, the third is about video centricity. And some of you may remember the 1964 World's Fair in uh, Flushing Meadows, New York, where AT&T actually introduced the video phone and said, soon, mom, you'll have to do your hair up in the morning before you go into the kitchen because you'll be on the phone with a video phone. And they were absolutely right in concept. And you know what? We have the video phone. It was just introduced uh, April a year ago. And it's called the iPad. It's the first video-oriented mobile device. And so I think that these three events together have created this third revolution, which will change the way we interact with other people and the way we interact with ideas. A simple example is, again, think of Yelp. Yelp is very text-oriented because I go look at a, I want to know about this store or this place or this restaurant or whatever. Imagine um, the, the problem with a Yelp and text orientation today is I have no, concept, no context for the information. If I ask you or if I ask the waiter at the restaurant to recommend a dish, I have a context. I know who they are. I can judge, are they like me? I can judge, do I trust them? And the problem with text is you have none of that context. But imagine now that uh, Yelp and other services like that are all on video, or any way to connect people are all about video. Now I have more data on which to judge the credibility of the information that I'm getting. And so I think that the third communications revolution is here. We're in the middle of it. And you know our tendency is to project out the future based on what we know today and what we see today. I think the confluence of these three, um, these three factors will lead us to a new way to communicate and interact with people that we can't imagine sitting here today. David, thank you. I love the idea of video centricity. It's good for journalists. Okay, Hugh Bradlow, Chief Technology Officer of Telstra. You've had a stellar career in, uh, in the academic world and you were named one of the most influential people in Australia's technology sector. So come on, give us your vision of the future. Um, thank you, Leslie. The, the problem with coming last and comparing it my vision to clean water for a billion people or 150 year lifespans, as it seems very prosaic. But, but um, look, there are two things. The first is I optimistically, I think we're about to enter a, a new era of uh, economic productivity and that's gonna be dr driven by three things. The, the first is cloudification, which is uh, using the cloud computing to cut the Gordian knot of IT complexity. The second is omniscience, by which I mean being able to know and act on everything. So we're seeing machine-to-machine -machine communications allowing you to measure every conceivable thing that is subject to measurement and to being able to act on that measurement to do optimization of the entire system, whether it be a human being, infrastructure, or crowds. Um, and that's also being enabled by a trend in what's called big data, which is the ability to take all that flood of information and analyze it and to act upon it. Um, the third is uh, what I'll call om omnipresence. And um, David's touched a bit on this with the, the era of video communications, but uh, thanks to ultra high um, speed broadband and new screen technologies, we're seeing a flood of the ability to transfer video from any place to any place, and that effectively allows us to teleport ourselves from any place to any place, and I think that will change uh, things like transport infrastructure dramatically in terms of the way we, we move forward in the future. Um, 
However, unfortunately, being an engineer, I've got to end on a pessimistic note. And um, I think the Achilles heel of the whole technology revolution is something pretty banal, and that's batteries. Um, I think uh, that this revolution could be brought to a screaming halt by the failure to develop uh, improvement in battery life that's anything other than very marginally linear today. Okay, well, I don't know whether any of the other participants have got an answer to that. Batteries, is, is that the problem in the end? Seems it's, rather surprising. Uh, it's significant, but as a cloud guy, it just means you'll have to do more computation <laughs> in the cloud. So it's okay. <laughs> it's okay for me. Anyone else? Well, yes, I think, I think batteries are a huge problem. Um, there's uh, the father of a friend of mine has a pacemaker. <clears throat> Excuse me, he's 85, and the family has to decide whether to intervene now to replace a battery and with the risks of surgery. So uh, you know, I've often said the next startup should be a battery startup, and I, I fully agree. Um, plugging into something is just, uh, just absurd where we are. If nobody's got any comments, I'm going to ask Jin Zidel to just expand a little bit on Blue Planet Network and what he's about to do for it, because he's, he's going to do something extraordinary and physically demanding. Go on, Jin, tell okay. us what you're going to well, do. I'll, uh Thus far, I've invested uh, one half of my personal wealth, 10 years of my time, and the majority of my mind space in Blue Planet Network. And in a few days, uh, June 16th, I'm going to make my biggest investment of all, and that is my body. I'm really putting my body on the line. June 16th, I will be one member of a four-person bicycling team that will uh, is entered in a race called Race Across America, and it is the most difficult bicycle race in the world. It's a third longer than the Tour de France in one half the time. Starts in Oceanside, California, ends in Annapolis, Maryland, 3,000 miles nonstop. The four of us will bike across the United States in seven days. The, uh, probably the most interesting aspect of that is that I had not been on a bicycle in my life until, well, the last 40 years at least, in, until October of this year. My uh, teammates are 35, 47 and 53 years younger than me. <laughs> and uh, we bicycle five hours on, five hours off, five hours on, five hours off around the clock for seven days, and they're each going to do 110 miles a day. So uh, I would say that I'm fully invested now. Money, mind, time, and body. How much training are you having to do? Um, well, I started in October, and I'm doing about 35, 40 hours a week now. And why are you doing it? Well for Blue Planet. It's just another, it's a fundraiser for Blue Planet. Uh, last year, this team that I've joined uh, uh, did it last year for Blue Planet. I, of course, went back to the finish line to congratulate and thank them. And I said, I'm going to do it next year. And, and one of their team members dropped off. And so they said, well, come do it with us. So uh, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing. I think that deserves a round of applause. Yes. Yeah.